Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Last year I was supposed to come, but I got stuck under that ash cloud in the UK, a uh, volcano whose name no one can pronounce. So I'm really happy that I'm here in one piece. Um, I thought I would start by giving you a sense of how I got started with Sound Source. Um, the story began 11 years ago when I was a disgruntled math and science magnet high school kid in LA. And I received a scholarship from, of all places, the Lorillard Tobacco Company, which is a big tobacco firm based in Maryland. And it was for $10,000, and it was for, for not smoking and, uh, and being some sort of positive role model. And I decided that it was really weird to use big tobacco money to go to college. Something just felt really funny to me about that. So I, uh, I explored other options, and I started doing online research. This is back when most of you were probably like five, so there were uh, AOL dial up connections. And I remember logging on and, and looking for stuff I could do with the scholarship money, and I found a volunteer program through the American Field Service, which is a, a really old institution that connects people uh, to exchange programs overseas. So I found this volunteer program, they had just launched it, and it was in Ghana, which I, which I discovered was in West Africa. I didn't know much about African geography at the time. And I convinced my guidance counselor and parents and a bunch of other concerned adults that this was a good idea. And, and then in what would have been the second semester of my senior year in high school, I ended up in this place, in Akropong, Ghana, which is about two and a half hours north of the capital city of Accra. And I was assigned to teach at the West African School for the Blind, which is the oldest school for blind kids uh, in West Africa, founded by the Queen in the 50s. And unfortunately, most of the materials that I had were also uh, dated um, you know, 1952. So I had, I had three textbooks and I had 60 kids. These are not the kids I taught. These are kids from the local church. Um, but my students were incredibly, incredibly bright. I had, uh, I had two classes, and it was a secondary school uh, class. And, and these kids would stay after school and ask me all sorts of questions about what books they should be reading. And one in particular really stood out to me. His name was Femi Abbas. And uh, Femi at the time must have been 10 or 11 years old, and, um, and told me that his favorite book was Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. Has anyone here read that? Yes. So you know, it's quite a sophisticated book for an 11-year-old to get behind. Um, and and I, I kind of didn't believe him, and as I got to know Femi, I started learning that he was this brilliant kid. And I started getting to know uh, other students. I, I ended up forming a creative writing club at the school. And they were just these little sponges. They were so hungry for knowledge, and there was nothing for them in this very poor school. Um, there was one library, and it had all broken windows. And so all the books which were in Braille were warped from the monsoons. And if you were a blind kid, I just I can't imagine how you'd even get around in such a library, let alone be able to read a book. And so this was the state of this school. Um, and, and yet, that didn't seem to phase my students. One of them wanted to be a journalist. Another wanted to be an English teacher. And all of them wanted to leave Ghana and come to the United States, which they saw as the land of opportunity. It's worth taking a moment uh, to describe how these kids lived so you can get a sense of what their reality was like. Most of them were from families that survive on less than $3 a day. And that's adjusted for purchasing power. So that's what $3 would buy you in the US in 2005. And that's the reality for about 4 billion people who we share the planet with. And most of these children were blind as a result of preventable causes that had occurred in early childhood. They had lost sight because they were poor. And it became clear to me then in Ghana that I had stumbled into a pocket of incredible talent that was going to waste. Where I come from, I live in Silicon Valley, and it's, it's easy to think that we live in a meritocracy, that there's some rhyme or reason to who makes it and who doesn't. If you're a hacker and you, um, you, you move to California and you've got a good idea, you'll find lots of backers on Sand Hill Road and you can be successful, and you'll probably be tempted to think it has everything to do with, with, your, own, with your own merits. Um, but what I learned from my students is that the 4 billion people who live on less than $3 a day, people like Femi, are poor not because they lack talent, but because they lost the birth lottery. So I left Ghana wondering how a country that seemed so rich in human capital could be so poor. And, uh, and I got back, and some of you might have seen these slides before, um, <laughs> I got back to a huge stack of these little blue aerograms 
that had been penned by the brothers and sisters and friends of my students. And uh, they were all asking for help with stuff. So this one asked for some money, like $50. <laughs> Calculator, mm -hmm. pens, a box of water. Um, Richard, he's my only friend. <laughs> <laughs>
going out into a room running a red sea entail. So if you're a young man in Mogadishu, your rational choice is to become a pirate. To be sure, there is a huge informal economy across the developing world that involves the exchange of a mind-boggling array of goods and services. But these are largely made by and for local markets, and those local markets are capital-starved. This young boy, this is actually a picture of a guy I met in Haiti, um, makes about a dollar a day. He's selling to other people who make about a dollar a day. And if he's lucky, he maybe gets a rich tourist like me who can actually afford his wares. But this is the problem with a lot of our traditional approaches to development. We believe we, if we give these entrepreneurs a little boost, if we give them a micro loan, they'll be able to dramatically improve their livelihood. But if, if they're selling to other people who make one or two dollars a day, that, that um, level change in income that we're expecting to see just doesn't happen. Um, so other jobs you know, involve stuff like hawking agricultural produce. And the data that we've seen have shown that this is not really transformative, that making small investments in these kinds of entrepreneurs, while far better than anything that existed before uh, microfinance, is not really resulting in the kind of change that we hope to see. And, um, and the only thing that development experts can really agree on, I used to work at the World Bank and was, and was shocked at, at um, how little we all knew about what made poor countries less poor. But the only thing that we could that we could all uh, agree on was that the path out of poverty at a macro level for a poor country is trade with a wealthier one. Trade can be a leveler when the terms are fair. But the problem with a lot of international trade today is that it tends to help the wealthier people or the elite class within the poor country because those are the people who have the resources to build firms to trade with the wealthy world, right? And so the benefits of trade 